help UNESCO member states in developing and implementing national information policies and no uh, knowledge strategies uh, in a world that is increasingly dominated by internet and ICTs. And uh, in order to uh, achieve, uh, achieve this goal, the IFA program concentrates on five priority areas. Um, as you can see on the slide, and I will briefly uh, mention, uh, one area is information for development, that focus on the value that information, access to information uh, uh, has to addressing development issues. Uh, other areas, information literacy to empower all the people uh, to seek, evaluate, use, uh, create information for their social, personal, or uh, professional life or educational goals. Um, the area is information pres uh, preservation, and part of our today's session will be devoted also to this area. What is uh, follow the principles of Memory of the World program and uh, to serve as a catalyst in uh, ensuring that we preserve for the next generation uh, the cultural and so so uh, societal values. And uh, uh, information ethics uh, aspect is one of the major aspects of IFAP work to cover ethical, legal, societal aspect, and the last but not least is information accessibility uh, uh, area last but not uh, least is information uh, surrounding availability, uh, accessibility, area. and portability of uh, information, including for those uh, people uh, with uh, in including uh, for those disabilities. Uh, and actually, the uh, latest uh, area where uh, IFAP starts its working is uh, on multilingualism to ensure diversity of uh, information in terms of uh, language coverage, to ensure that language is not a barrier in accessing information. And given its key role in contributing to the formulation of national information society policies, uh, uh, UNESCO and IFAP have organized numerous discussions and forums and uh, also uh, IFAP working group of on information ethics has uh, uh, refined these inputs coming from these discussions into the code of ethics for information society. So uh, today uh, our distinguished panelists so we'll discuss several topics uh, of this ethical debate. We are not able to cover all the topics, but some of the uh, major ones. And one area what uh, we are going to explore is the impact that design of information systems has on the ability of users to participate in online governance process. And uh, how can we better incorporate human rights as a design and operational creation in, in, in developing uh, information systems. Uh, and uh, this uh, aspect will be presented by uh, Mike uh, Hinche uh, in uh, the pr uh, first uh, presentation. Another critical area is uh, the protection of personal data uh, in the cyberspace and uh, many policy makers as well as citizens are not uh, uh, sensitized enough or, uh, do not understand what is at stake in the area of data protection and a policy and legal framework as well as other mechanisms and uh, awareness raising efforts
considerations should be taken into account how to ensure diversity, authenticity, inclusion, uh, inclusiveness of the preserved data. These are some of the questions uh, what we cover in today's uh, debate. And um, uh, we will start first with, uh, with uh, presentations and um, uh, after that I would like to encourage uh, participants of this uh, session to share uh, their views, ask questions and enrich this debate um, and this will follow the uh, presentation from the panelists and we'll uh, for communication and information sector uh, of UNESCO and he will share his uh, views and uh, after the panelists uh, presentation and now I would like to give a floor to the first presenter uh, professor Mike Finche uh, from Irish Software Engineering Center and um, is a professor of software engineering at the University of uh, Limerick in Ireland and uh, he was uh, uh, also uh, in his uh, career served as a director of the NASA Software Engineering Laboratory and he still continues to serve as a NASA expert so uh, Mike uh, the floor is yours Mike? Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Mike is okay. uh, presenting Can remotely. You hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Mike is okay. uh, presenting Can remotely. You yeah, we hear you. Mike is okay. uh, presenting Can remotely. You okay. I'm trying to share my desktop to give you my slides. I'm trying to share my desktop to give you my slides. I'm trying to share my desktop. Uh, Mike, we do have strange echo. I'm trying to share uh, my desktop. Actually, I can uh, uh, show your echo. slides if uh, uh, this uh, can help. Actually, I can uh, show your echo. slides if uh, uh, this can help. Actually, I can uh, show okay. your echo. slides if uh, Okay. Okay. I'm finding it very hard to hear you. I'm doing everything three times. It's overlapping. It's very hard to hear you. I'm doing everything three times. So, Mike, please uh, start your presentation. So, Mike, mm. please uh, start your presentation. So okay. Um, first slide is just titles, so we can ignore that. And uh, the next slide, slide is, just is um, I was asked to speak on the topic of design, and, and so what I'd like to do is just deviate ever design. so slightly. So and explain some interest in ethics and the privacy aspect of that. Um, two years ago, I received a letter from Aircom, which is a telephone and broadband company in Ireland. I'm not a customer of theirs, but I have internet at my mother's house, so when I visit her, I can keep online. And the company wrote to say that on December 4th, which was a few days earlier, I had illegally downloaded a song using their broadband facilities. 
and then if I did it again, they would disconnect me for a week. And if I did it a second time, they would disconnect me permanently. I was pretty upset about this because, first of all, there was nobody in the house on the alleged date. I had never heard of the song, and I had never heard of the artist. And additionally, I have never downloaded music from the internet, ever. So I called the Data Protection Commissioner, who said, yes, I agree with you. This is a breach of privacy. This is unethical. Um, my argument was that if the, the phone company, the broadband company, could monitor what you downloaded, and that was like your bank listening in on your phone transactions. It's completely unacceptable. So following my complaint, the Data Protection Commissioner decided to take Faircom to court and to prosecute them. Uh, in fact, they told me they'd been trying for many years to go and prosecute them, but they wanted somebody credible. They looked me up online, and as a software engineering professor, I sounded credible. As a result of the complaint brought by the Data Protection Commissioner, the music companies, EMI, Warner Brothers, Universal, and Sony, took the Data Protection Commissioner to court to get an injunction to stop him prosecuting Aircom on the basis that they wanted this to continue to stop illegal downloading. Well, the court case eventually occurred. It made it to the High Court in Dublin, and the judge, not understanding what the phone company were doing, actually sided with the record companies. The record companies also broke the court's order of naming me in court. They weren't supposed to. And as a result, this became uh, commonplace in the newspapers. It wasn't a big deal for me, but uh, it could have been. And again, privacy was at issue. So in our design processes, we have to be very careful to consider security and privacy. I hope you're seeing this slide headed design. And this is absolutely essential. So as part of the design of our system, we have to consider those components outside the system. So we used to call them open and closed systems, but or nowadays cyber physical systems because we have some interaction between the system and society, or people at least. So there's an idea that we can model humans as agents. So these are components Mike, that are outside sorry the to interrupt you. Um, there's a problem with the slides. Can you please go to the top of your screen? You see uh, on the top file, edit and share. You go on share and go down share to mm -hmm. my desktop, if you have it on your yeah. desktop. It's not, a, it's not an option. It's so you need to enable them. To do that. Yeah, but it's not... Um, I, I'll ask the technician to enable box. you to do that. So, is it an option okay. now? Now it's an option. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for this interruption. That's okay. And rather that than have you not be able to read the slide. So I just I see them now. Thank you. Bit. Can you see it now? So it is important that we call, we consider those humans that are going to be part of the system and going to be using the system in some way. So this means, of course, considering disabled people who may need particular fonts, who may, may need uh, voice support, etc. So what we can do is we can actually consider policies of things that should be allowed by the system and build these into the design of the system. So this allows us to, if you like, specify both allowed and expected behaviors of the system. So typically we would use some sort of scenario or use case to describe expected behaviors, but we can also use them to allow, uh, to describe allowed behaviors. So we've been working on this for quite some time 
trying to develop mechanisms from which we can take our requirements, whether those are requirements of the system or requirements for behavior or interaction with society, or requirements for things that we often consider to be non-functional, such as security and privacy. And we want to generate code. So essentially, we need to develop various models from these scenarios, these requirements or policies, whichever you want to call them, that we can use to generate code. And if we have good models of our system and good design, then there are many existing code generation tools that can be used to generate very good code. And indeed, there are a number of model extraction mechanisms that we can use to take existing code and determine what the design of that system was. In fact, there have been a number of FP7 projects on this area. From models, we can actually extract some form of policies based on the mathematical laws of concurrency. So these are essentially mathematical equivalences between combinations of systems. And from that, with appropriate labeling, we can determine exactly what policies were that were built into this model. Sorry. Button. And we can actually reverse these laws to give us what we consider to be round-trip engineering, so that we can go from requirements through to code, and we can go from code back to requirements, and that, of course, means we can adapt things in various ways. So, so far, we've used this in a number of agent-based systems, and as I said, we would typically use agents to model humans, to model groups of humans, uh, fragments of society, that we would then put running as a society of agents and that would interact in various means, and we can examine the interactions between them. We've tried doing this in wireless sensor networks, which of course would be very important because if we want to consider humans and their human rights, their rights to privacy and so on in the development process, we want some form of input from humans, and more and more this is going to be using things like wireless sensor networks, or FID, uh, things like that, rather than asking them to press buttons on keyboards. We've worked in a NASA mission called ANTS, which is a, a very complex mission to explore an asteroid belt and to bring back information about asteroids, all that will run autonomously in space and, and also in the space domain. We've been looking at how we can verify the robotic procedures of the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, the telescope, as you probably know, was built uh, to be launched and taken down every five years for servicing. But when it was launched, it had to have new solar panels put on it, and as a result, it no longer fit in the hold of the space shuttle. So all repairs had to be done in situ. So these are the repairs for the most recent uh, Hubble servicing, um, which was done by a combination of, of humans and uh, not robots as was originally intended, but uh, robotic devices such as um, uh, complex uh, screwdrivers and so on. The document here looks very like Microsoft Word because that's exactly what it is. And the first column is timing constraints, and then the next three columns are the activities that are to be done by originally the robots and then subsequently the astronauts at various times and uh, in various parallelizations. And uh, this is very complex. Uh, it runs to about 5,000 pages in total. Uh, the big advantage of Microsoft Word is that you can tag it in with XML and you can generate a version that you can use. So what we were able to do was to take these requirements, these are policies that how this will be done, and feed it into our tool, which uh, you can see is called R2D2C, Requirements to Design to Code. And you probably can't quite see up in the top left of the screen the logo, which is the R2D2 robot, uh, which George Lucas gave us permission to use. But what it has done is it has taken the effectively natural language input, which is really all the Word document was, and turned it into a mathematical design. And what you're seeing here is a very small fragment of that design in a language called CSPM. 
which is machine possible and reasonably easy for a human being to read. From that, we can generate code. And you'll see here that there's a problem detected, a deadlock. That deadlock means that there's been a conflict in the policies, in the requirements that were stated, that they clash, that two things cannot be done at once. These are not uh, mutually satisfiable. They cannot run at the same time. Indeed, this error was detected on the first line of the 5,000-page document. Now, we don't think that they wouldn't have found the error by other means, but our tool was able to find it quickly. So we believe it's going to be possible to generate policies for how uh, applications, how computer-based systems are run, and how they interact with the outside world, or how they accept input from humans. And part of those policies are going to be rules about privacy, uh, human rights, security, safety, etc. So the idea is that policies are essentially rules that you're going to apply. They're very high order of requirements. They're going to include consideration of disabilities and other impairments of people so that these can be specified in the systems. And then specific policies can be created for safety, security, privacy. Uh, these are things that we often consider to be non-functional. They're not part of the system. And that's why they're policies. They're policies because of the environment in which they're run. And of course, we may have different policies for different environments. And we may have policies that change over time depending on how the environment changes. And these policies can be implemented by a policy manager. And this would be something that is automated. So this policy manager would be an additional component in our computer systems that is going to ensure that the policies we specified are maintained at all times. And it does that effectively by running a simple program that is ensuring the policy is running, and rather that one of the valid policies is running, or in, in the case of we want to have multiple policies, we specify those. So that's how design, I hope, in the future will contribute to ensuring privacy, safety, security, and human rights, and equality. Uh, within our ICT sector. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. And uh, now we move on to the uh, next presentation by Ms. Eskedar Nega. She is a program officer in the Development uh, Information Services Division at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. Um, and um, before uh, that, uh, Ms. Neg lectured in international, international public law and communications at the University of Law in Toulouse, France. So, Ms. Uh, Neg, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. I'm very pleased to be here with you for this uh, workshop organized in uh, collaboration with uh, UNESCO. I think it's the second time we are uh, putting uh, up a joint workshop in the framework of the uh, Internet Governance Forum. Uh, as it was said by the uh, moderator, I am a program officer at the UN Economic Commission for Africa. For those of you who are not very much uh, aware uh, about the UNECA, uh, just to tell you that it's one of the regional commissions of the United Nations Secretariat uh, dealing with African affairs and based in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Uh, the main mandate of our organization is to promote socioeconomic development of the continent through international cooperation and uh, uh, regional integration. Um, for that, we uh, our main areas looks at uh, uh, development of uh, uh, the whole area of regional integration, uh, economic development and trade. Uh, we look at issues of food security, uh, <coughs> gender development, uh, as well as uh, information and communication technologies, innovation and science and technology, and it's the division in which I um, in which I belong to so I don't know how we organize ourselves for the slides okay 
uh, and the uh, the area that I wanted to uh, touch upon is to briefly um, update you with the current trends in African countries. Uh, actually, um, the way we were organized, I was supposed to give you the uh, overall regional picture uh, that was to be illustrated by a country case, Morocco, but unfortunately, Mrs. Miriam Benami couldn't make it. Um, the rationale here, while uh, we uh, look at uh, issues related to uh, uh, personal data uh, protection, is that uh, now for the last 10 to 15 years, African countries have uh, really embraced uh, or have reached a certain political uh, momentum, uh, actually thanks to the World Summit on Information Society and have put the information and communication technologies at the top of their agendas, of their political agendas. And as a result, most of them have um, validated or formulated strategic frameworks on how they could use these technologies to address economic growth in their uh, different countries. Um, in other words, uh, as these policies have been uh, developed for the last, uh, again, 10 to 15 years, it was, it became clear and um, uh, I would refer to the metaphor you were using uh, uh, chairperson uh, with regard to the deployment of technologies and then the formulation of cyber legislations. Cyber legislations clearly appear to be uh, one of the main pillars that needed to complement the policy uh, work that was undertaken on the continent. Uh, and within uh, this, um, pillar of looking at cyber legislation, issues related to how do we legislate and how do we regulate electronic transactions, how do we look at cyber security and how do we look at cyber criminali criminality, as well as how do we uh, guarantee a certain number of principles around the issue of personal uh, data. Um, Along the effort to formulate national cyber legislations, there's also a current political momentum together with the African Union Commission to look at how do we then harmonize this uh, national cyber laws at sub-regional levels so that it can also help uh, uh, regional integration and cross-border uh, trade and business. So it's based on this uh, rationales that um, the uh, UN Economic Commission for Africa, together with the African Union Commission, worked at a draft legal, uh, draft regional legal instrument called the Convention on Cybersecurity that sort of define uh, the major principles and the major guidelines to ensure that the 54 African member states adhere to a minimum set of principles with regard to uh, regulating e-transactions, uh, combating cybercrime, um, uh, defining rules uh, in terms of uh, cybersecurity as well as personal data management. And this is what I'll be uh, talking to you briefly this, um, this afternoon uh, to share with you the basic principles that have been agreed in the context of this convention and what, is, uh, what are the next steps in terms of uh, changing this um, text into implementable and practical and realistic actions within the uh, African member states. Of course, you will all uh, note that the African continent uh, faces a number of challenges in terms of infrastructure development, but we also believe that the uh, information and communication technologies give uh, a tremendous amount of opportunities for the African youth and uh, a lot of innovation is happening as it can be illustrated with the formidable use of mobile technologies in various areas of social and economic uh, sectors. So in the framework of uh, this, uh, this work we've been um, doing with the African uh, Union Convention, th the personal data uh, is uh, defined as an information relating to an identified or identifiable uh, natural person by which this person can be identified directly or indirectly in particular uh, by reference to an identification number or to one or more factors specific to his physical, 
uh, uh, physiological, mental, economic, cultural, or social identity. So this is the basic uh, definition of personal data that the member states have agreed to consider while regulating and while setting, defining a legislative framework for personal uh, data protection in the African continent. Uh, in terms of uh, the personal data processing, of course, um, uh, the economic aspect of processing personal data is not there uh, on, a, on, a, on a practical manner in many countries, but we are seeing that a lot of economic opportunities are, uh, are, uh, are coming up in a limited number of countries, but uh, we are uh, tabling or anticipating that this will create a new area of creative uh, industries around ICTs. Um, but the processing that is uh, addressed here is the operation conducted with or without the aid of automated or unautomated procedures and applicable to data, such as, and here you have a, a list of different uh, types of actions uh, that are involved in terms of personal data processing, going from the gathering, the exploitation, the registration or the utilization of communication through various means in terms of processing personal uh, data. Um, so the, uh, the, conv the African Union Convention on Cybersecurity defines the minimum uh, standards for uh, legal frameworks for personal data protection in Africa. Uh, its main objective is, of course, to combat breaches of private life uh, that are likely to arise from the gathering, the processing of, uh, and storage, of course, and use of personal data in the continent. It also, uh, the legal framework also ensures that any data processing in whatsoever form respects the freedom and fundamental rights of physical person. I think this is something uh, which is critical um, in, in view of the uh, various political changes that are happening in the continent and uh, based on the core belief that data pro protection is really at the, at the, at the uh, uh, is a cross sector, at the cross sector of uh, ethics, rights and also security, um, security matters that a country has to deal with. So while recognizing the prerogatives of the state, the convention or the document mm, that has been, uh, that is being looked at now at the level of the African Union ensures that the rights of local communities and the target for which the businesses were established are really uh, there to be, uh, to be taken into consideration. So as it was uh, said uh, earlier on during the, uh, or illustrated during the first intervention, uh, a number of actions are authorized to uh, look at uh, in what context data, personal data can be uh, processed in the African member states. Those data, data can uh, have, uh, may uh, have to do with genetic information, health research, uh, various kind of information on uh, offenses, convictions, or security measures, it can uh, deal with national identity number or any other identification of similar nature. It can deal with physiometric information as well as data of public interest. This is what is considered throughout the um, regional legal instrument that we are sharing here. Uh, of course, uh, in, um, to complement on this uh, data with regard to state security, defense of public security, all issues related, all data related to various kind of investigations and population survey uh, are also uh, taken into consideration here. Uh, with regard to the uh, institutional framework, and I think that's uh, also uh, very important for most of our African member states, that complements the legal framework defined by this uh, regional uh, instrument is to ensure that each member states of the African Union Commission shall establish an authority with responsibility to, personal, uh, to protect personal data. Uh, as far as my knowledge is concerned, I think we have now uh, about five countries uh, that have um, set up uh, this uh, institutional framework to uh, authorities 
that have been mandated to protecting personal data in countries such as Burkina Faso, Senegal, or Morocco, to name but a few. But uh, the importance uh, is that um, this national authority shall be an independent administrative authority with the task of ensuring uh, that the processing of data is conducted in uh, accordance with domestic legislations that would be inspired by the African Convention. Uh, this is again the uh, independence of such an authority is an area that is uh, not always uh, common in most of our socioeconomic sectors in our African countries, but it's the uh, sine qua non condition for uh, personal data to be protected and some uh, uh, principles that we uh, cherish a lot in this document. Um, so in terms of the main functions, I will not go into the detail, but the uh, authority is uh, there to ensure that the processing of personal data is consistent with the uh, provisions of the convention, and also that uh, ICTs, and they are defined as uh, neutrally as possible, do not constitute a threat to uh, public freedoms and private life of uh, citizens. Um, with regard now and very rapidly, and but I guess we will come back to it during the uh, debate and discussions, in terms of the basic principles governing the processing of personal data, uh, I guess these are similar to uh, the, the, the uh, reflection or the conceptualization of issues that are happening in other regions. But again, the document here, the, the, the legal framework, the African legal framework, uh, looks at the uh, issue of consent and legitimacy of personal data uh, processing. Basically, is it legitimate for the organization or for the institution to process the, 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 the personal data? The issue of licitness and honesty. Also, uh, the fact that uh, the, um, the, the, the uh, processing has to be object objective, relevant, and uh, issues of conservation are, are dealt with. Uh, at the top of also the principles that govern the processing of personal data is the uh, whole area of accuracy and transparency. Uh, the fact that individuals need to be ensured that the data that is being compiled under their name is accurate and they can access to it in a transparent manner. As well as the uh, issue of confidentiality and security of personal data processing. So these are the basic principles that guide the whole area of personal data processing in the African Convention. With regard now to the rights of the persons whose personal uh, data are, are to be processed, um, these are all, um, you would say, basic rights but need to be um, uh, reaffirmed, but beyond the words need to be uh, uh, concretely uh, implemented, is the whole issue of right to information that the individuals need to have the information of the data that is being uh, processed, the data that relates to them and that is being processed. Uh, their right of access to this data need to be guaranteed. Uh, the right of opposition in case they want to oppose the data that is being uh, compiled on them and the right of correction or suppression when uh, matters arise as well as the obligations of the uh, personal data processing official is being uh, uh, is being ensured through uh, areas of confidentiality, security, conservation, and sustainability. So um, uh, again, these are very uh, important and critical uh, principles that are uh, needed to ensure that personal data processing is is uh, defined within a set of rules and regulations that are open and transparent and that can uh, address ethical issues. So in terms of the next steps, what we are looking at is, of course, as I was saying earlier, beyond the words, the adoption and transposition into the national legal system of this uh, of these guidelines uh, and uh, promote the, uh, the adoption of national, national legislations on this area. Uh, we're looking at uh, building the capacity of law enforcement agencies on this and also looking at how we can raise awareness of decision makers on the economic uh, dimension of personal data processing in Africa. So I think with here I've exhausted my time. Thank you very much for your attention and looking forward for questions and debate on this later on. Thanks. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And uh, now the floor uh, goes to Peter. Uh, Lore, who
Marco is uh, 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 professor uh, and uh, in library sciences, and uh, uh, he was uh, the first national librarian of South Africa, uh, and uh, served as uh, secretary general for International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. IFLA, and um, uh, his uh, recent uh, research focuses on international and comparative librarianship and information work and the political, economic, and ethics of international information uh, relations. Uh, so the floor is yours. Um, good afternoon. Uh, is my Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. I feel very honoured to have been asked to address this uh, this workshop. Um, my presentation is at the intersection of, uh, of two of ISAP's um, priority areas, namely information ethics and information preservation. And the the fact that I am the third speaker reflects the foot race of which we saw the image earlier on when the uh, chairman introduced us which showed us the technology, the code coming first, then the law and all that goes with it, and finally the ethics, which should have been first coming last. <laughs> um, so I want to look first at preservation. Can you go on to the next one, please? Okay, right, preservation is a good thing and you will find many uh, expressions of this concept also on the UNESCO, UNESCO portal. Next slide, please. But this is an ethics statement. This is a statement of, of, of ethics. If you say something is good, you have to ask why it's good. And so perhaps we can approach this question by asking what is it good for and for whom is it good? Next, please. So for what is it good? Well, we preserve stuff. We preserve information. Um, and I'm talking now about preservation in general before we get to the digital part. We preserve it for administrative and legal purposes, for scholarly and scientific research, for education, for aesthetic appreciation, because it's beautiful, uh, for tourism, think of all the monuments and, and so forth. And we also do so for socio-political processes. And this is an interesting one. I flagged it in red because it has sometimes quite interesting ideological and other overtones or undertones. Next, please. <coughs> and good for whom? Um, is it, it is of interest to persons and groups that are referred to in the content, in the documents, to their descendants, to administrators and legal functionaries, to curators of collections, to historians, scholars, and scientists, and of course to tourism operators, if you think of bricks and mortar monuments, to governments, and then of interest here in particular, again one with a little bit of red uh, 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 color there, to um, contending parties and groups. For example, uh, if one thinks of South Africa, you think of land claims, and so you think of the documents that are needed to support uh, uh, land claims cases in courts. Next, please. Um, all of these uh, purposes and uh, users may have con conflicting interests and conflicting ethical values are at stake here. For example, and I can't deal with all of them, I will um, I have produced a, a paper which I suppose will be made available to on, this on, the, on the website. Uh, and so I'm not going to deal with each of these which I do not have enough time. But if you look at the conflicting interests and values, think of records which put people in a bad light. And recently a member of the British royal family was uh, found himself on the widely watched on the internet as a result of perhaps a decision that was lightly taken in a moment of weakness. Uh, and there are, must be many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of young women around in the world who are horrified to discover many years later that their images can still be found on the way back mm. machine. We have the use of images for persecution, 
Um, and an early example of that in a non-digital context are those images in the film uh, The Unbearable Lightness of Being, where photographs were being used to identify people who had uh, taken up, taken to the streets in opposition to the, in, in Budapest, in opposition to the, uh, to the, to the Soviet invasion. Um, and this, of course, is even more easily done today when uh, footage of riots and demonstrations and so forth is, is not only aired, but also preserved. The display of traditional artifacts may be problematic for traditional societies who do not want their, um, uh, certain of those artifacts to be seen by anybody just anybody. We have the commercial exploitation of traditional knowledge. We have the digital manip manipulation and, and reuse of, of uh, content such as in mashups and fan fiction in the case of digital materials. We have seen uh, archival records targeted in certain conflicts as part of eth ethnic cleansing uh, um, attempts because if you can delete the records of who lived in a particular area when they finally come back from the, from the camps to which they fled, they will find it impossible to prove their property and that they lived there. The rewriting of history, I've touched on that already. Every nation uh, is concerned with um, rewriting its history in every generation. And this is particularly the case when we deal with such issues as the history of liberation movements where perhaps in a country there were five or six liberation movements, but one of them came out on top. And when digitization projects start, then it's, the, it's only the heritage of the successful, the most successful movement uh, that is uh, digitized. Um, and then the, uh, we have uh, other technical issues such as the deletion of articles from electronic journals for various uh, reasons. The objections of research subject is an interesting case as well. We have seen cases in the United States where members of, an, of a certain Navajo tribe uh, uh, discovered that their genetic material had been collected and used for purposes to which they had not agreed. And so they wished this material to be destroyed. Next slide, please. So I've mentioned a couple of problems that arise in the preservation of information content, but as I say there, to err is human, but to really screw things up, you need information technology. Then you can really do it on a big, on in a big way. So, so far I've been talking about preservation generally, but now I'm moving over to um, the uh, digital content, and I'm referring not only to digitized material, but also to born digital material. There are slightly different aspects to these two, but in general, uh, most of the principles apply to both of them. Now, what makes digitized and born digital context, content uh, more challenging to deal with uh, ethically I is derived from its basic characteristics, among which one can mention the huge volume of this material, its extremely rapid dissemination, just make one false click with a mouse and it's your email that you regret ever afterwards is gone. Uh, it's irreversible. Uh, it's very ephemeral. It can also disappear very quickly, but you can't control whether you, if you want it to go away and disappear forever very quickly, you, you it may stay there for, for generations and otherwise stuff that you would like to keep disappears, such as uh, uh, certain uh, census data and, and NASA data and so forth. It's very fragile. It can easily be damaged in various ways. Uh, and I think you, we, tend, we tend, when we're dealing with uh, um, digital content, we tend to forget how very fragile it is in comparison, for example, with clay tablets from Mesopotamia. Those clay tablets were buried in floods. They had walls falling on top of them. They were burnt and so forth. And yet today it is still possible for experts to decipher them. If you were to do the same thing to any digital medium, it would be completely impossible. And then, of course, they are very open to misuse. So all these exacerbate the ethical conflicts that arise in the, preser in the preservation of content. Now, what sort of ethical approach can one apply here? And in uh, an article and various things that I have written with my colleague Johannes Britz of the University of Wisconsin in, in Milwaukee, 
Um, we have used a, a, an ethical approach uh, which is based on information related human rights. And we've used twin sources for that. On the one hand, uh, the, the theory of justice of, of John Rawls, and on the other hand, we've used the human rights statement such as the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Next slide, please. And um, on the basis of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we've identified uh, a set of human rights. There are actually a few more of those, but I've only put nine on this slide. And I've put human in, in, in brackets because one should be aware of rights, human rights inflation. So some of these rights should be seen as corollary, corollary sorry, of uh, human rights as in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In other words, they are derived from them, uh, but they are not, uh, as it were, first generation human rights. But these relate to privacy, we've spoken about that, freedom of expression, a freedom of access to information, the right to communicate, the right to share in the benefits of arts and sciences, the right to control uh, the dissemination and use of a work, uh, a right, for example, which is, is in conflict with uh, the making of mashups and fan fiction. Um, the, the right to maintain the, the integrity of work, of, of a work, same thing. The right to be recognized as the author or creator of, um, of a work and the right to own intellectual property. So here are eight parties that have an interest that are rights holders that, that in whom some or most of these rights vest. Um, authors, uh, in the case of traditional and indigenous knowledge, uh, the originating communities, the rights holders who are not necessarily the same as the authors, in fact, in many cases they are not, they are publishing companies or huge media corporations. The holding institutions in the case of, of items uh, that are uh, digitized, for example, archives that are digitized, the holding institution would be the archives from which that material comes the persons depicted in them, and one can add to that also their, uh, um, uh, their descendants, the digitizing institutions, the project funders who fund the digitization project, or who fund a, uh, a, web, uh, a web harvesting project for that matter, the ultimate users for which this is done. And the rights of interested parties uh, have implications for the responsibilities of information professionals and other parties. And most of these actually have responsibilities as well as rights. So um, one can, I can give you one example briefly. Um, originating communities have a right to autonomy and self-respect. That means that, they, that we should avoid exploitative donor-driven projects where uh, materials and content is, is, uh, are digitized uh, mainly for the interest of people in, in, in other countries. Uh, and such projects should be equal partnerships. Uh, we should also consider the opportunity costs. Should a national library in a poor country be digitizing material that will mainly be used by American scholars, or should that, uh, uh, that time and those resources rather be used for a literacy project, for, for, for reaching out to the community? Um, uh, the next uh, slide, please. Um, let me also then touch on, on issues such as metadata and unconscious cultural bias. If we are digitizing things, we add, dig uh, we add metadata, and we should be sensitive in what metadata we add, and also bear in mind who are going to use that information. Next slide, please. <coughs> so a similar analyses, and I've gone over this very quickly, uh, similar analyses can be done uh, of the rights and responsibilities of all the other parties that I have mentioned. Uh, I have um, published, I give you a reference there to an article which was, um, in fact, has just been published, I think, last week uh, in the American uh, Society, the Journal of the American Society for Information Science and Technology, in which we deal in, in more detail with the, the rights and responsibilities of these various parties. Next slide. We are under huge pressure to digitize. We are 
very aware of everything that is being lost. Uh, we are very aware of all the all the information that that is being uh, born digital information that is constantly being lost. Next slide. So we feel impelled to do something, and I share that concern about material that is being lost. So for sure we should do something. But the decisions that we take about digitizing and preserving born digital material should also take ethical implications into account. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for this enlightening presentation. And now, uh, uh, before inviting uh, other participants to share their views, um, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Janis Karkwinch, Assistant Director General for Communication and Information uh, of UNESCO, and um, I should uh, this is process uh, was very influential. Ha um, you heard that at, at this session and at sessions before, and I, I would like to mention uh, that uh, Mr. Karkwinch was uh, uh, president of preparatory committee of the WISIS Tunis phase in 2005. So, uh, Mr. Karkwinch, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, following the path set by Professor, uh, Professor Lohr, uh, I can say that um, the fourth person is not anymore on the, or was not at all on the picture, so therefore it is very difficult to be the, the fourth speaker. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I would like maybe to share a couple of um, uh, observations and uh, would, would briefly talk about uh, UNESCO's work on um, uh, questions related to uh, information ethics or ethical dimension of information society. We uh, recently uh, made uh, a survey among member states uh, in preparing the document for executive board on the ways how UNESCO could address uh, issues of ethical dimension of information society in the future. And one of the uh, very clear messages which uh, came out from this um, uh, survey was uh, that issue is so complex that uh, the understanding is, or uh, uh, let's say unanimous understanding of all issues related to ethical dimension uh, are not yet present and uh, we need uh, continue uh, exploration uh, and understanding what do we mean by uh, ethical dimension of and I see that uh, the topics we can address uh, can vary enormously and uh, actually we can talk about everything because uh, every single aspect of uh, uh, digital world uh, carries certain element of uh, ethics. Second, uh, second point, it is also obvious that the discussion, international discussion about information society and the needs and the challenges of information society is shifting is shifting from uh, the um, debates about infrastructure, about access, about lack actually of infrastructure, about lack of access, about exclusion of um, majority of population of the planet uh, from the information society uh, to the issues related to actual use of internet and use of uh, technologies. Uh, 2005, the number of internet users uh, in the world were not uh, more than uh, half a billion. Today we're talking about 2.3 uh, billion. Uh, at that time, uh, the number of mobile phone users were less than a billion. Uh, and all of them uh, were, I mean, the mobile phones at that time were not used to access internet or very few of them uh, uh, were. Today we're talking about uh, close to, to 7 billion uh, mobile phone users. Uh, a very a big part of it uh, uh, using uh, uh, smartphones uh, with, the, with the mobile broadband and can access uh, uh, internet. 
uh, of course there are still issues related to the price of the access uh, but grosso modo uh, issues of access one can argue are uh, resolved or will be resolved in in the very near future at the same time we see that uh, more and more questions related to use or different aspects of use and consequences of, of, of those as well as misuse of uh, technologies and internet comes to forefront and uh, we need to find a way uh, to address them to understand them and find the solution uh, the easy part is maybe to agree on principles but when it comes to practical implementation at uh, finding solutions or remedies for uh, issues related to misuse of technologies so there, there of course our um, imagination sometimes fall short and uh, we are uh, more willing or leaning towards um, res uh, restrictions and this is a kind of a natural reaction of any any human uh, or any uh, politician or uh, civil servant rather than find it finding uh, solutions which are maybe more difficult uh, but would uh, find the right balance between freedoms and uh, responsibilities so all, all this is very very complex uh, in nature and therefore uh, debate on uh, ethical dimension uh, is uh, extremely complex and highly political uh, so we are trying to um, uh, in our work address those uh, those issues through um, uh, EFAP international um, uh, program information for all which uh, um, uh, where, where we have a working group um, uh, on information ethics chaired by uh, Andres uh, we are also addressing those issues in our um, uh, daily work uh, through uh, different uh, different uh, programs uh, and activities uh, let me just touch touch upon one uh, uh, issue which um, uh, uh, Professor Law addressed and this is uh, very fresh on my mind since uh, UNESCO uh, organized together with IFLA and other partners uh, uh, international conference on um, uh, digitization and digital preservation in Vancouver uh, last September um, where uh, it was also uh, very clear that our understanding about the digital preservation and I'm, I'm talking about long-term digital preservation I'm not talking about 10 years or, or 15 years I'm talking about 30 50 years uh, our understanding about that uh, seriously lags behind the uh, speed of technological development once we are reaching certain point which we think uh, might work technology is gone uh, far and we're catching catching up so as a result and also uh, because the technology allows us for instance uh, uh, very cheaply uh, 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 save information what we're doing we're just saving everything uh, hoping that one day we will find the, the right answers to uh, information uh, treatment and then we will uh, start uh, preserving or saving selectively but today we're serving everything uh, as a result uh, we're saving also things which m many people would like to be forgotten so uh, and we do not have uh, many uh, specialists uh, in the field of digital preservation and uh, and preservation of or, or uh, treatment of digital information because um, the um, the uh, library sciences on digital preservation are not sufficiently developed yet and uh, who are people dealing with uh, let's say current preservation of information these are techies and techies have completely different education they have completely different uh, vision of the world and uh, for, for them uh, maybe the, b the, uh, the uh, best criteria if uh, if one needs to uh, find the, the place on the on the hard disk is to delete the the biggest file that's the that's the logic of engineer uh, but certainly the biggest file mod might be also the, the, mo the most um, uh, valuable one for the, for the future so uh, there are many many questions and uh, UNESCO is um, uh, dealing uh, with it uh, to the to the best of our abilities uh, this um, um, uh, roadmap has been endorsed by the um, um, executive board 
Uh, it uh, contains uh, four major areas of our activities. The one is building multi-stakeholder partnerships to raise awareness on the ethical dimension of information society and strengthen actions in this area. The second big area of our activities uh, would be to contribute to international debate on ethical dimension of access to and use of information and, and uh, today's workshop uh, clearly uh, contributes to, um, to this area of our activities. Then uh, supporting capacity building at national level, again to, uh, to make sure that people understand what they, uh, what they talk about and, and what they aim at uh, uh, engaging in, the, uh, in the, these debates on ethical dimensions. And finally, the research. Uh, again, uh, the issue is very new, particularly when it comes to digital uh, uh, field, and um, uh, we will be look looking to all possibilities of um, uh, engaging uh, with the research institutions uh, in developing further methodologies uh, and best, best practices uh, in the field of uh, information ethics. I will stop here and would be uh, very pleased to answer questions if, um, if there will be uh, any. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And now it's time for, for interventions, comments, views, uh, questions from, from the audience. Uh, yes, please. Uh, please introduce yourself. Thank you very much. Um, Graham Ross. Um, um, uh, I had the European operation of eBay PayPal spin-off called Modria, in which um, focuses on online dispute resolution. In fact, I'm uh, moderating a session on that here on Thursday morning. And obviously, uh, these issues of privacy uh, are a constant in in the developing the ethics of resolving disputes online. But if I can make, first of all, a quick point to Eskadar. Um, I think you said quite, and it's good to hear the move to harmonization throughout uh, Africa on privacy issues. You made the point that one of the drivers to that is to encourage cross-border trade throughout the continent, and indeed one could say to become a safe harbor for international trade generally. But what I can say is Europe, of course, has this harmonization of privacy and for some time now, but it hasn't actually affected or improved the single market. Cross-border trade in Europe has remained poor. What they're now doing in Europe is introducing um, right now a directive about to come into law at the end of the year, the beginning of next year, called the alternative di ADR Directive on Alternative Dispute Resolution and a regulation on online dispute resolution, specifically in order to achieve the aim. So they've looked at privacy. Privacy hasn't helped cross-border trade. And I think one of the reasons for that is the problem with privacy breaches, most people don't know when it is breached, and there is a lot of apathy towards that. But it hasn't. And what will move forward is the development of facilities to resolve disputes in a global justice system, cross-border, not connected with the courts or whatever. Um, and uh, that's one, one quick point. And a quick uh, question, really, also to all of the panel, and particularly to Peter from his talk. Yes, and yes, these points we all know uh, are important in privacy, but aren't there, it seems to me, these constant challenges that I just feel it's the tide is constantly going against it. We've got the, 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 we've got the challenge, as I see it, of social networking and the fact that the newer generations of people embrace that as part of their life, the gain of the, te of, the, of the lifestyle of what it gives them almost makes privacy irrelevant. And I think it's the founder of Facebook said controversially, privacy is dead. Then there is the, the question, obviously, the security benefits of intrusions into privacy balanced. Um, finally, I suppose there is the... Um, there was a, a there is the pace of technology of course is constant and i think data protection officers around the world will always say it's hard to ever keep up with the legislation as peter you me you mentioned that was always tracked behind and uh, just finally just general apathy so i wonder peter whether whether you feel there is this risk that actually we can never catch up and ultimately future generations maybe 5 10 years ahead will will just have no interest in the seeing a need for privacy 
well, I suppose one does sometimes feel a bit like Sisyphus um, in, in that you are busy with an impossible task and you'll never ever complete it. Uh, I, I do think there are things that we should be trying to do and, and uh, UNESCO's uh, four points that have just been mentioned, I think, uh, go some way towards that. Uh, uh, raising awareness a and of course I would like to um, emphasize uh, um, that there should be more ethical awareness there should be um, we should be uh, teaching uh, and making our students librarians the IT people uh, the techies or at least the bosses of the techies aware of ethical issues. And this is happen happening in increasingly in the United States and also there's an organization in Africa which is working specifically on African information, information ethics. Uh, and by the way, while I do have the floor, I'd like to make one additional point and that is to say that um, there are many different traditions of ethics. Largely we've been approaching this from a Western ethics tradition, of course there are a number yeah. of Western, Western uh, uh, traditions, but we haven't really been looking at these information ethics issues from an, uh, an, a Japanese or a Chinese or an Indian or an African perspective. And that's just by the by a point that I wanted to make somewhere along the line. Yeah, uh, no, I take, I take full note of uh, the first part of the comment uh, on the um, Second side, uh, with regard to uh, privacy issues as they um, speak to the youth, you know, it's, it's um, everything is relative. It's when you live in societies when you think that your rights are guaranteed that you feel you don't really care. But uh, we still face uh, or live in uh, some countries and some societies where those basic rights are not really guaranteed and privacy again being contextualized in various environments still mean a lot uh, even for the techie uh, youth community uh, and in most of uh, African countries I mean we've seen it recently with what is happening with the various uh, uh, revolutions or movements Is that okay? Thank you. My name is Ian Fish. I'm from the UK and I'm representing BCS, the Chartered Institute for IT. A uh, couple of things. One in answer to Graham. I, I think the, uh, the, um, the idea that privacy is dead has actually sort of changed a little bit in the last year or two and that's mainly due to increased awareness. I think privacy activists have uh, increased awareness quite a lot. And as a result, uh, there's been quite a lot of pushback against the people who are seen as taking privacy away. I also take the point as well that uh, the ethical dimensions of privacy are very different in different societies. I'm talking here from a European viewpoint, I think, and perhaps a North American one as well. Um, but um, the other point I wanted to make, and what I, why I really asked for the, for the, for the thing, was again to, to Peter's thing. Um, he was saying that, that, that uh, digital preservation of uh, uh, in preservation of infom digital information is uh, very difficult to achieve, and it is. But in some countries, there are actually already quite stringent uh, rules about how to do this for preservation of evidence, uh, which might provide, I'd like his opinion on this, might provide a way forward in trying to come up with methodologies for actually digital pre preservation of digital information uh, more widely than just for evidence purposes. This, uh, this is an interesting aspect which has been dealt with uh, fairly recently, recently by a group of people from the Bibliothèque Nationale de France uh, where they are implementing uh, um, legislation on the legal deposit of, uh, of the web. W in which they attempt to collect everything, to, to harvest everything that is on the French part, <laughs> if that can be, as far as that can be determined, of, of the internet. Uh, and one of the, they've actually 
outlined a whole number of legal and ethical issues, and one of them exactly relates to the question of whether, under which circumstances, that material uh, must be made available because some of the material might be defamatory and you might require or I uh, it to be deleted, but at the same time it might be needed for, for, for evidence in court eventually. If you're going to use material for evidence in court, you will, of course, have to have procedures in place to be, ma to be very sure that what you are collecting is authentic, that it's properly date stamped, and that all the metadata that are involved are, are in place. I'm moving now again <laughs> immediately to the technical solutions to these questions. Um, so I'm not sure how watertight any system can be of collecting everything. Certainly those countries where they are ex working on and have trying to implement systems for using legal deposit legislation for collecting uh, everything that's on the web uh, are having a lot of, of problems. Uh, it's one way of doing it. It might work better in small smaller countries and be more difficult in, in larger countries. Uh, it might work more easily in a country with a, an, an, a non-English language, for example. It's much easier to identify material, for your, for your robot harvester to identify material in Finnish, for example, than, than to determine what is the British internet. Thank you. Uh, any uh, other comments, uh, questions? Yeah. How's that? Okay. Um, I'm Robin Wilton. I'm the Director of Technical Outreach at the Internet Society in the Identity and Privacy team. Um, and I think um, uh, between you and Peter, um, you've raised some really fascinating questions about the balance between what we can achieve through technology and what we can't achieve through technology in these areas. Because ultimately, Peter, as you said, when you've got issues of conflicts of interest and conflicts of values, technology can't solve those. It can sometimes be a tool. Um, and my, my question's going to be to what extent is it actually a usable tool and how far can it get us? But just to give you an example of what I mean, if you think of something like uh, law enforcement access, as Mr. Fish mentioned just now, really what you're talking about is not a different set of data. It's about applying a completely different discipline to the same set of data. And therefore, the challenge that governments face, for example, is how do they take the information that they have about the citizen and use it in one context to provide joined up e-government services, to which we're all supposed to nod, <laughs> and use it in a different context to achieve non-consensual joining of data about you for law enforcement purposes. And there are very few technic technically savvy companies or organizations that can achieve those two so different perspectives on the same set of data. And I think asking governments to do it is pretty optimistic as well. <laughs> I just wondered what you think. How, how far can technology take us towards that? And beyond that, how far are we dependent on governance measures and, and individual behavior? I, I think that it's the, uh, that's the in individual and corporate ethical sense that has to come first. Uh, we technology can be used if to implement some of these principles. Uh, for example, um, if you are doing web archiving of political websites um, and you have material relating to dissident groups, and those you have to download the material before you can ask the dissident groups for permission. You A, might not get permission from them and B, they probably will answer, uh, by, the, by the time they answer, the website will have disappeared. So the answer is, uh, and this, these um, tools are always blunt instruments. The answer there is to put everything into a so-called dark archive. And it's very interesting because in the case of the French National Library, they put everything automatically in, as far as I understand, into a dark archive, with the result that uh, stuff is in the dark archive, which is actually openly available in the, in the web. And that's simply because the systems or the algorithms are not capable of of dis discerning these types of, of, of fine distinctions. That's why I really would like to emphasize the importance of ethical education for business people, for IT people, for librarians, so that a general ethical sense uh, sort of imbues us 
and, and not the sense that, you know, if it's, if it's legal, it's okay. Because all of us around this table have been screwed multiple times by companies which have, wo have operated entirely within the law. So, yeah, please, you, you have comments? Uh, microphone, please. We have uh, one comment here, and uh, are there any other comments from the audience? Thank so you. Okay, can you hear me? Ah, good. Yeah. So we, we will uh, have uh, we have about five more minutes. We started later, and uh, so please stick to this side. Yeah, just a short question. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Um, I have. I would like to pick up a point that Professor Law made. He said that um, ethics are very different in different cultures, and I totally agree to that point. And I would like to know what the UNESCO does to meet this uh, intercultural aspect of ethics. Yeah, thank thank you. Uh, indeed, we we do. Uh, we're uh, working on um, uh, intercultural dialogue. Uh, we're working uh, on um, uh, on the program called uh, Culture uh, for Peace. Uh, and uh, as Professor mentioned, indeed, there might be different uh, perceptions uh, in different uh, cultures uh, of the ethical issues. Uh, recently, we uh, we saw. Uh, the reaction uh, of um, uh, of people on the publication um, uh, of um, a very um, uh, tasteless uh, documentary uh, insulting one religion uh, and uh, these uh, uh, issues uh, which raised by uh, the fact uh, were uh, widely discussed at UNESCO uh, and I believe that they will be also discussed in, in the future. Uh, these, these phenomena are not new. What is new, the uh, uh, ability uh, to uh, disseminate information uh, throughout the world, uh, which, um, uh, which was the case with, with this uh, 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 case I, I, I referred to, uh, and certainly the uh, dialogue between uh, cultures uh, on different topics are uh, absolutely essential uh, in order to foster understanding. And uh, UNESCO um, uh, does that work uh, through uh, its uh, programs, uh, including programs uh, in our member states. Thank you. And uh, do you have a comment? Yeah, please. Please introduce yourself. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm Julia Pole from the Free University of Brussels. I have um, a question concern, yeah, concerning UNESCO. Uh, so the question to Yanis. I'm surprised when I hear this, uh, what UNESCO just decided, and I'm, I'm happy that actually UNESCO deals with the subject, but I have the impression that um, it's the same, the same discussion that we already had in the last probably 30 years. If you look at the history uh, of the debate, um, UNESCO and probably if less well was already working on this question in the 1980s and 90s. Uh, UNESCO had a lot of conferences, info ethics conferences in the 1990s. And I have the impression we constantly start to, to reinvent everything from zero. Uh, so I wonder um, why this happens. And uh, Janis mentioned that there is a, it's a very political um, question actually. And I wonder why there is this um, resistance on a political level um, to consider these kind of questions and what UNESCO is doing to actually raise the awareness, uh, what was decided now, to, to raise the awareness and to stimulate the debate. Because I wonder if we didn't succeed in doing this in the last 30 years, um, what has to change to actually have a political debate on these questions? Thank you. I, I think that there are um, uh, issues uh, in this world uh, which uh, requires permanent attention and uh, issues uh, are or we need to uh, address issues almost on permanent basis 
because of changing external environment. Uh, and if we uh, can find maybe solutions uh, to one situation, then uh, by changing external uh, criteria or, or, or environment, uh, the, uh, that solution may not be any more appropriate. And as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the uh, technological development uh, these days is so rapid uh, that uh, we need to rethink uh, and uh, look for uh, solutions to problems which did not exist before, uh, simply because the environment was different and challenges were different. Uh, let's take uh, issue uh, related to um, uh, freedom expression. Universal Declaration of uh, Human Rights uh, is um, universal because everybody agrees with principles enshrined in Universal Declaration. Uh, but uh, it is very easy to agree on principles, but it is not so easy to um, uh, implement those principles simply because our understanding and our uh, history um, may differ and our appreciation uh, of uh, these principles may be different. Uh, therefore, uh, this uh, dialogue is permanent and we're condemned to repeat this uh, all the time and uh, to, um, to deal with it. Uh, freedom expression uh, or as, as suggests um, Universal Declaration and also uh, International Covenant on Political Rights suggests that uh, one right should not impinge or rights of one should not impinge on rights of others. That's fine. But uh, when, we, uh, when we're observing real world, uh, we see that uh, some people may uh, consider expression which would uh, one would argue it falls under freedom expression uh, would uh, feel that as uh, uh, offensive so we are in permanent uh, search of the balance uh, between uh, competing rights and that is why uh, we need to um, deal with the, these issues uh, quasi on permanent basis and we need to reaffirm uh, our understanding on freedom of expression and freedom of, um, of speech as a fundamental uh, right and whether that is in the real world or that is in the virtual world. And we need to protect uh, those, uh, those rights uh, simply because uh, people may, may think that uh, uh, these are not relevant anymore in the new environment. So maybe a little bit long ans answer to your question which, was, which is fairly complex. Thank you very much. Um, as you heard, um, oh, we still do not have a, a common agreement around the world about all the ethical challenges, but uh, the developments uh, in technologies and on internet uh, bring uh, us uh, new and new challenges. So this ethical debate is never uh, is is uh, not going to stop anytime soon. And I would uh, very much encourage you to take part in this on ongoing debate and um, also those of you who are interested in this, uh, 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 please uh, follow the discussion organized by UNESCO at, at IFAP at the uh, Information Ethics Working Group and uh, uh, please contact me and uh, I will be happy to involve you into this uh, ongoing discussion. And. Uh, Thank you very much, a special thanks to our uh, presenters and panelists at this discussion, and uh, thank you all, and thank you also our remote participants. Thank you.